those who are hoping to see Ben Hodges, it's another Ben H, sorry, Ben Haddad. Uh, I'm the director for the Future Europe Initiative at the uh, Atlantic Council in Washington, D.C., and it's really my honor and privilege to moderate this uh, roundtable today on the EU as a global power, pipe dream, or reality. It's a panel uh, in partnership with the Atlantic Council, and we're very proud uh, to be able to partner this year with the Warsaw Security Forum, which is really the preeminent forum here on uh, security and defense issues. So I think this conversation is really timely as we are a month away from having a new European Commission take office. And Ursula von der Leyen, the new Commission president, said that making Europe a geopolitical power was going to be one of her main priorities. And if we look at what we've been through in the last five years since the last Commission took office, it is true, as General Petraeus said, that not only is history back, but it never left us. It's just that Europeans thought that they could leave us. In 2014, we start with Russian aggression on Ukraine and the annexation of Crimea. In 2015, the migration crisis, which is a direct consequence of a foreign policy crisis in Syria and Iraq. In 2016, Brexit, one of the two key military powers of the European Union, votes to leave Europe and still struggles to do it. And the same year, President Trump is elected on a platform that is critical of the European Union, that is critical of NATO and US engagement, for the first time really questioning the transatlantic relationship. And at the same time, in the last few, year, few years, China has become more and more assertive. So what does it mean for the European Union? Can it stand on its own as a power? What is its value added on the global stage? What should the new commission do to really be able to assert its power and defense the interest and security of its citizens? This is what we're going to talk about in the next hour with a great uh, panel, very diverse uh, in terms of geographical representation and experience. So let me call our speakers uh, to uh, the stage. Let me start with Carmelo Abella, the Minister for Foreign Affairs and Trade Promotion of Malta. <laughs> Pavel Koval, who has been an MEP and Secretary of State at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Poland. <laughs> Pavel Koval. Well, let me call the next ones. Uh, Jens Plotner, the political director for the Federal Foreign Office of Germany. <laughs> Frantisek Rushika, the State Secretary at the Ministry of Foreign, Af Foreign and European Affairs of Slovakia. <laughs> and Karin Valenstein, the State Secretary at the Prime Minister's Office in Sweden. We have an hour, uh, so I'm going to ask all of you to give your take on this issue and answer one of the questions. What should the next commission do? How can the European Union assert itself on the global stage? What should be its priorities? And what is, is its value added, both for the world, but also for the citizens of the European Union? I'll ask you to answer one of these questions, to speak shortly, three, five minutes, because then we want to be able to uh, open it up to the room and have uh, a debate. Let me start first with uh, Minister uh, Abella. Well, thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to be here. It's my second time at the Warsaw Security Conference. Hi, good to see you. I think that the main um, focus of not only the new commission, but any commission, and us politicians are the people themselves. So I think that we need to focus on uh, the future of our people. Of course, that will impact positively on the future of our nations and our union. So I think that the very fact that we are talking about the European Union, it's already positive in itself. So it's not a dream. We're, not, we're talking about something that has been in existence for a number of years now. Um, everyone acknowledges that it was, and it is, a positive project that united Europe after the Second World War, and that was the start of the European Union that we know today. Yes, we have our challenges, and who doesn't have challenges? We heard General Petraeus talk about some challenges that the U.S. is facing. So uh, I think that uh, the, fact, the very fact that we are talking about the European Union itself, which is uh, by far a very positive project in itself, it's not a dream, but it's reality. 
Now, whether we are uh, or we can be more of a global actor, that is debatable. I think that the European Union can be more, let's say, especially in the region and the, in the neighborhood, can be more of a leader. And I think and I aspire that that will happen soon. But we are leaders in other areas, for example, the social fabric that exists in Europe. I think it's second to none. So we are global leaders and global powers when it comes to uh, certain and specific areas, such as the social fabric that exists in uh, member states. We are leaders when it comes to standards and standardization of um, a number of areas. We are moral leaders when it comes to mm, rights, uh, like LGBTIQ rights and other rights. So I think uh, we have to be a bit more specific what we understand by uh, the European Union becoming a global leader. I believe that the European Union is already a global leader when it comes to a number of issues. Um, my, my take on this will be that I want a European Union that is more also a political leader, uh, not because we are not, but beca because we have the potential to be even more, especially in our neighborhood. Thank you uh, very much. A standard leader, a norm leader, but not yet a political leader, if I understand you uh, correctly. Uh, Pavel Koval, do you want we, to... We can be more. That's we what should I'm, be more yeah. and can be more. Pavel Koval, do you want to uh, react to this? Um, <coughs> Thank you. Thank you for the invitation, and I'm a little bit more skeptic. I think that, uh, of course, uh, the EU was closest to be on the position of global leader, global power, uh, but different questions of global actor. Global actor is, of course, European Union is, of course, global actor every time, but the question is about uh, position of global power. And I think that EU was closest to this, po closest to this position uh, about 10, 11 years ago. It was the key moment. Today we have a few real problems. Uh, how to uh, hold the position, uh, global position as a power. The first one I think is uh, that EU, in my opinion, lost the interest of the external world. If you want to be global power, you should be more interest. You should be have more interest on the situation in external more, uh, in ex external world. The second problem is the problem of the military forces, European army. We should remember that in practically in ho in all post-war post discussions about the future integration the concept of European war army was the one of most important after the Second World War. Today we have a very big problem. Of course, we, we, ca we, ca we can use that concept of, uh, of uh, non-military power, but if you want to be non-military power, we should have, m we should strengthen more uh, uh, um, Atlantic, uh, Atl uh, Atlantic links with U.S. and NATO, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Next, uh, next problem is uh, weakness of European uh, weakness of European leadership. Today, we haven't, in fact, any person who can be European leader and effective leader in uh, any country. Ten years ago, we had, uh, for example, Angela Merkel. She had very strong position in uh, German polit politi politics, and she can play a role of the European leader uh, around the world. And of course, two main problems. US policy towards European Union, completely against a post-war tradition to strengthening transatlantic links, and uh, very aggressive policy of Russia against the unity of European Union. Uh, in that context, I should underline that in my opinion, today we have very big problems to discuss about uh, European Union as a 
global real power. Defending our interest, investing in our military power, and the question of leadership. I think these are all three questions that are often and asked. And the, and, the, and the policy of Donald Trump. Yes. Well, uh, and the uh, Russian policy towards the European Union is also these, important. These are all questions that have agitated Germany, actually, in the last few years, both domestically, but also sometimes as a target of criticism from Donald Trump and others. Let me ask you, Jens Plotner, how you apprehend this, uh, this, que this question. I run the risk of being boring, but I have to admit I can subscribe 100% to what uh, both colleagues here on the, on the podium said. Um, I would, by nature, at the end of the day, be a bit more with the optimistic ones and say that um, we are starting a new <coughs> institutional cycle in Brussels in a few weeks, and I think that offers an opportunity. <coughs> I think um, Ursula von der Leyen has, uh, has created a quite lisible new brand saying that this is supposed to be a geopolitical commission uh, and, uh, and I think that offers some opportunity. It doesn't seem to be only words. For the first time we have a Directorate General for Defense and uh, for Space Affairs, for Space Industry. So, so I see what, what you addressed, um, that we are lacking behind in Europe in our military integration with the aim of this being the European pillar within NATO, that's the way we conceive it. I think there is an opportunity now for, for going ahead with that, better than ever before, with the president of a commission who was for long years a defense minister, so she knows what she's talking about. If I can add one other dimension, which uh, the minister uh, touched upon is, um, I think Europe needs to reestablish a dialogue with the big powers. This is lacking now. We have a very good China strategy. We, um, I think, can be proud of that. This has to be filled with life now. So that's, I think, one of the tasks ahead of the new commission. Secondly, even if it's difficult, we have to speak with Washington. Uh, there are many things, despite the disagreements we have, there are many things we see eye to eye on. And Washington is more, as General Proteas reminded us, than the tweets. So there too, I think we need a very intensive dialogue uh, between Brussels and uh, the US. And I think the fact that Secretary Pompeo came to Brussels a few weeks ago to meet the new team, that's an extremely important and positive sign. And thirdly, and I know this might be controversial, but I think I never say it, I have to, have to put point this out nevertheless, we need to again have a dialogue between Brussels and Russia because if we like it or not, there are some things where it is in our very own European interest to talk about with Russia. And let me say something uncontroversial as environmental issues. We look at uh, the, the rainforest burning in Brazil and talk about that. At approximately the same time, the forest was burning in Siberia, not less damaging for our global climate, and we hardly talked about that. So there are, I think, issues we need to talk about with Russia. And let's not play the, the game Moscow is trying to play in bilateralizing its relationships with EU member states. We stand to lose there. We are stronger if we speak together with Russia. So I would advocate that this new uh, European Commission should also, there where it suits our interests, reestablish a high-level dialogue with Russia. So a geopolitical commission that can lead the way for dialogue with great powers, China, the US, and Russia, at a time where, especially in Washington, all the talk is about great power competition. Um, let me turn to you, uh, State Secretary Rushika, on, uh, on this issue. Uh, I'd love for you to react to what we heard and, and have your view on this. Well, good, uh, good afternoon, and thank you very much for the invitation for this conference. I think it's very important forum, I mean, for us to discuss these things. And let me say that, of course, uh, I would like to admit two things that I'm, I still believe, I still do believe in the European project and the European cooperation because it's still, I mean, it's bringing a lot of the benefits for all the member states that are participating. The second, I don't believe and I don't think that it's the end of the transatlantic uh, leadership in the global and world policies. And that's, that's one of the pillars where we have to build on. And now the question is, of course, that is put here and asked here where the European Union and Europe stands in the whole 
also in the transatlantic bond, but also in the global politics. You mentioned that we have a new commission. And really, we do have a very good new commission, and I think that I have to do the chapeau barrels, witnessing the whole Game of Thrones of looking for the five leaders, future leaders of the European Union. And I think that Ursula von der Leyen is a good leader. She really showed the, the determination, and it was not easy task to put all the pieces of puzzle together to create the commission that respects many balances which is important for the European Union, because that's first key word for the European Union, it's the balance. And she created the political balance, she created the geographical balance, and she created also the gender balance in the Commission, which reflects really the priority and, and the values of the, of, the, of the European Union. Without values, we are nobody. And without values, the European Union cannot be the leader in many of the politics and policies we have mentioned here. So we have to go back, I mean, to these basics, and to say, okay, we are the standard setter in the values, and be it the human rights, etc. Now the three questions are, when you ask, in economy, is Europe the global leader? And I think no one will say that no. The Europe, European Union is a global leader in the economy. Look at the GDP, look at the volume of trade, look at the volume of investments. It is, we are the leader. Is Europe a standard setter in many global policies like climate change, human rights, etc.? Yes, we do are. Yes, we are the global leader. But is Europe a leader in the global politics, global diplomacy, and the global issues? And I'm not quite sure. And it was also mentioned by several of the speakers here that there are several, well, we always recall the words of Henry Kissinger saying that there is no telephone number, I mean, to call for the global issues of Europe. And so that is the second take, that if we are not consistent and united on the global policies, we will not be playing the global role as Europe. We may become, again, the richest guys who are paying a lot of nations, a lot of money, but without having the really benefits of that, only the certain kind of deterrence, the ODA, for example. It's an important part, but it does not solve the problems. So the, the third thing that Europe has to do is, I mean, to, because the new commission comes to the new era with the two things. The first, the new challenges and tasks, and, but the third, the, the second, is the old ones. We have migration, we have Brexit, we have the economic crisis from the past, because after the decades of the heydays and, you know, the 90s of the last century, when we were all looking at the new world that will be united, Europe prosperous, we are coming, I mean, very, with the many scares in the second decade of the 21st century. So that's the first, Ma create the order at home. And the second, and I think Minister mentioned it, we even lost the leadership in our neighborhood policies mm -hmm. in the Western Balkans, in the Eastern Partnership, in the, in the, in the North, North Africa, and et cetera. We are not anymore there, someone, I mean, who is really appealing. And if we don't do this right, then the European project will not be any more attractive as it is. So I think that this is a very important, important thing for, for the new commission and for all of us to, to do for the future. Make our neighborhood great again. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a great slogan that we should give to uh, the new high representative, Joseph Borrell. Uh, I think it is very important to talk about the neighborhood and uh, how the EU should assert itself, especially when you see China and Russia coming in, and the Western Balkans, and Central Asia, or in, or in Africa. Um, let me, to finish, turn to you, Secretary Valenstein. We talked about values and interests. We talked about the EU being a standard setter, a norm setter, but not really a political power. W what should the EU do, and what should be its value added on the global stage? Well, thank you very much, and thank you for being here. I, it's my first time, and I enjoyed it very much so far. Um, let me also pick up on the question on the, on the dialogues where the EU, EU can participate and what do we bring to those dialogues because I think that's where our added value comes in and this uh, in a couple of days we will start seeing the uh, the Nobel prizes come in and in 2012 uh, it was the uh, the EU who w received the the Nobel Peace Prize and I'll, I'll read just what the Norwegian Nobel Committee said. It was given, he was awarded for over six decades, contributed to the advancement of peace and reconciliation, democracy and human rights in Europe. So it, what they were really pointing to the stabilizing part that has been played by the EU. 
which has transformed e e Europe from a continent of war to a continent of peace. But the, Nobel, the Norwegian Nobel Committee didn't stop there. They gave us more clues to the added value of the EU by naming EU's most important results, which is the successful struggle for peace and reconciliation and for democracy and human rights. So EU can really has really proved itself to be the global actor that stands up for core values, such as rule of law, human rights, and gender equality. And we need to expand those uh, values uh, also to the global level, and I think that's what we bring to those dialogues. Um, international law and the rules-based order, we, we see it being challenged, but EU can have the collective strength to remain firm and principle and to stand up uh, against or in a situation of gra growing great power rivalry. Um, however, we only have that strength if we stand united and if we act in concert and speak with one voice. And that obviously adds to, to the challenges and, and the undertakings that we need to do. But again, I think we've proven this. Uh, when Take, for instance, the sanctions on Russia, where, where we stand united, and take the, the um, uh, sanctions after the Salisbury attacks. Uh, again, another, uh, another sign of our strength. However, let me also underline that all of it is not, is not just hard power or security policy. Uh, the EU can provide a role model to the world through how we provide more and decent jobs, how we provide safe and secure societies, um, we provide leadership on climate and on environment, on digitalization, on innovation, um, EU being the second largest economy in the world. So in summary, I think what we bring is, is our summary, uh, in summary, we bring our history, our values, we bring our collective strength, and we can bring leadership uh, on sustainable prosperity. Thank you very much. Collective strength and unity, this is, I think, a running theme. We've heard some optimism, some pessimism, some people insisting on values and interests, but I think clearly there's a common call for Europeans to stand together in great power competition and speak with one voice to defend uh, their uh, model and, and interest. Um, first, I'd like to thank all the speakers for keeping it on time. This is almost a record. I'm really impressed. I thought I was going to have to creep behind some of you to put pressure on you, but this leaves us actually quite a bit of time to open it up to, uh, to the audience. So please raise your hand. We'll have mics uh, circulating uh, around the room. I can't see uh, very well with the light, but I think we have someone over there, someone here as well. So do we have mics? No? Okay, so I guess speak up. Yes, over there, the lady in blue. And then we have a lady in red. Yeah, th we, ha we were going to have a mic coming. Sorry about that. Michael. Thank you. My name is Teresa Fallon. I'm with the Center for Russia, Europe, Asia Studies. It's great that the EU is finally moving from their old position of we don't do geopolitics to we will be a geopolitical actor, but it's more than just a slogan. How do you expect to do that if it's very difficult to get the EU member states to speak with one voice? Commissioner, um, President Juncker has said that the EU, it's impossible for them to speak with one voice on China. So with the very deeply divided EU, how can we see any geopolitical actions take place? We've seen, for example, Germany wants to lead on um, resurrecting dialogue with Russia, which you mentioned, but we also see a real division within the EU. So I see a lot of obstacles, and how are you going to put meat on this new geopolitical agenda? Thank you. Thank you. Let's take a second question here, and then we'll turn back to the panel. Uh, there was a woman, well, take it here, and then we'll have a third one, and then. Sorry for uh, hijacking the mic. Uh, Alexander Shimashko, Ministry of Entrepreneurship and Technology. Um, power obviously rests on uh, some fundamentals and the capa capacities that EU has. Uh, and EU used and still relies very much on its economic power, market power, trading power. Uh, how do we actually ensure that the EU is still capable in engaging uh, new trade partners in following the FTA expansion policy with the current political backlash against that, and not only on the national level, but actually when it comes to the European Parliament, 
regional parliament. We saw, we saw the Walloon parliament um, uh, being very forceful on international trade agreements. How do we prevent that, that the domestics hijack our international ag agenda? Mm -hmm. And then on the third row, still in the middle. Hello everyone, Lolita from North Macedonia, here with the new security leaders program. Well, whether EU is a reality or a dream as a global power, I do believe that EU is a reality as a global power. I do believe that the EU is a successful story and is a role model uh, in particular for the Western Balkans region. But I have one question um, to the guest, to the speakers. So whether EU is a dream or reality for the Western Balkans region, is a EU a dream or reality for our countries to become an EU membership? What is the EU perspective of our countries regarding your experience and opinion? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Well, these are actually three very complimentary and interesting questions. So I'm going to turn to the panel. You can pick whichever you want. Internal divisions and how can we carry our weight on the international stage, on Russia, on China, when we're so divided? How can we continue to be a trade global power uh, when there's such a domestic backlash in our democracies against free trade? And then the question of EU enlargement in the Western Balkans, and I would say more generally, you know, EU uh, policy in the Western Balkans, and if we have alternatives to enlargement as a tool of, uh, of foreign policy. Let me uh, just go in this direction and start with you. Okay, I'm tempted to pick the easiest uh, <laughs> question, but um, let me just first of all say to the lady from North Macedonia that it's um, heartening to hear that the EU still has this, uh, this appeal uh, to our neighborhood, and I think that uh, confirms your point that there is also reason to be optimist. We remain a very, very attractive uh, commonwealth of, 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 of countries, right? And uh, to answer your question, I would say yes. Um, from our point of view, from the German point of view, there is um, uh, the perspective of uh, EU membership for, uh, for your country, as well as for Albania. These are the two countries we are going to discuss in a, in a few weeks. The German parliament has just passed a, a vote uh, clearly stating that. And, uh, and we feel that uh, experience has shown whenever we turn our back to, uh, wow, that's a, <laughs> that's a fitting theme for this conference, right? <laughs> um, so where was I? Um, whenever we turn our backs on the Western Balkans, uh, problems rise mm -hmm. and we're called back into action in a situation which becomes more difficult. So, uh, so that is why we feel there is no alternative but the membership perspective. But um, <coughs> I think the um, slowly emerging French ideas on maybe having a fresh look on how we organize the secession process, uh, how we follow closer, how we monitor better, how we reward progress while in the accession process, these are quite interesting ideas we are willing to have a close look at. What we do not want to say this up front is that we end up with a uh, kind of a two-tier membership. Uh, that should not be the result, but that's not the way I understand it. So I would say yes, uh, a clear yes to, to your question. And the others I leave to my fellow speakers. <laughs> so you're optimistic that the EU Council will open accession talks in two weeks to North Macedonia and Albania? We would welcome it. Uh, but uh, I understand there are still some important partners who have question marks. Um, today we have a, a Dutch-German Council of Ministers. Uh, this will be one of the issues and with our friends in France, of course, we are in, in close touch. Uh, we hope that at the end of the day, um, the, the, the strong interest in stability which this perspective gives will prevail and we hope that the Council will take such a decision. Thank you. Minister Abella. Thank you. I will briefly try to uh, answer or give my, my thoughts on, on the three questions. Um, when it comes to speaking with one voice or the geopolitical aspect of the European Union, um, first of all, I think that the strength of the European Union is in its member states. 
And this can open a debate on the future of the European Union. What kind of Europe or, or Union we want to have, whether it is a federalist, whether it is uh, what we have today, and how uh, the institutions should work within the European Union, especially if there is enlargement with more member states, uh, who thank God aspire to join the European Union, uh, irrespective of uh, what we say about the European Union. Uh, today, the foreign aspect of, of um, the European Union depends on its member states. I mean, there is no, this is not the, the responsibility of the European Union or the Commission or the uh, High Representative to speak on behalf of member states, but it's member states that agree. We meet every month. Uh, I think this is the Council, the Foreign Affairs Council is the uh, Council that meets every month. We see each other every month and we have, um, we discuss the issues that uh, were already mentioned uh, by my colleagues here and by some of you uh, through the questions. So I think uh, this is a question of where we want to, um, to go as, as a union. But till now, foreign affairs is the responsibility of each and every member state. We discuss the issues, we can agree, and we can disagree on, on a way forward, uh, but I don't see it as something that is negative to the European Union. Um, this is uh, our strength, that we need to discuss issues and we need to agree. And that is why I said that I believe that the strength of the Union is in its member states, uh, first and foremost. Um, when it comes to uh, new trade um, partners, if I understood correctly uh, the question, at least from my point, I, I think that we are managing as a Union to have uh, new trade deals with, with different countries in different regions. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we do support as a country these, these kind of trade agreements that the EU is negotiating on behalf of member states. We do ratify them. I don't see, at least till now, I'm not seeing any, any issues. We might have some issues with some countries, not because of trade issues maybe, but because of other issues. Um, but I'm not seeing um, that we have an issue in agreeing and, and, and signing and ratifying um, trade deals with other countries. Finally, when it comes to the Western Balkans, uh, I can speak for my country's position. We do support the Western Balkans to, to join the European Union. Uh, it has to be merit-based. It has to be, um, uh, of course, um, um, there, there should be um, the, the, the changes, the necessary reforms from each and every uh, aspiring uh, country to join the European Union. Um, so uh, when it comes to the Western Balkans and their aspiration to join the European Union, we are all for, depending on the reforms, depending on, on the fact that the, the challenges need to be overcome. Um, but I, I say that um, even the European Union now has a, ch has, a, has a test. I think especially when it comes to North Macedonia, to be more specific, uh, we used to uh, ask the government of that country to settle the issue of the name. Now this is settled. So I think this is now uh, a credibility test also for the European Union and hopefully all member states will agree that uh, the first step of North Macedonia now to, um, to be considered as an exceeding country should be voted in favorably. Yeah, thank you. I do think it's a very important thing to underline after you know, all, all the bad news that we usually like to talk about, when there are good news, like the Presper Agreement between Greece and North Macedonia, the, the EU should uh, encourage it and, and, and build on the momentum, the positive momentum in, in the region. Secretary of State Valentin. Thank you. On, on the issue of EU unity, I would just like to point to sort of one paradoxical fact, and, is, and it's that in Brexit, the, the other EU countries uh, have remained very, very united. It's, uh, so that has actually sort of closed the group. However, I'd like to, to direct my attention to the issue of trade, um, because I do believe that there is a backlash uh, to trade uh, in very many countries around the world. Um, and I think we need to really understand why is that? Uh, I come from a country where 
My prime minister is a welder by profession. He is a trade union man. He's probably one of the most free trade positive people you can find. And why is a, is a worker from Sweden so positive about free trade? Well, it's because if we have a system, and I think, again, this is one of the areas where Europe can really bring something to the global arena, where you have a system where a change in production or a change in what we export or the fact that your factory closes doesn't mean that my future is lost. It doesn't mean that I lack an income, that I lack a health insurance, that I lack the possibility to pay for university for my children. If I don't lose all those things, but I knew that know that someone will be there to support me to find a different kind of job and have some training and reschooling, then I can feel uh, safe uh, if with free trade. So I think really addressing free trade is in many countries is also about addressing the systems that we have in our countries that, that give the possibility to um, for, for many workers, for many employees to feel that they are safe even when there is competition from other countries. That competition is, is good uh, for us. It's good for our countries and it's good for our enterprises. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary of State Usika. Well, thank you. I think that nobody in this room will be surprised when I say that for Slovakia the enlargement, especially enlargement of Western Balkans, is something that we are not going to bling on. And something that we think that without having the all, and I repeat all with capital letters, Western Balkan countries in the European Union, the European Union, the whole and free, as it was few decades said, is, is not going to be completed. We need the Western Balkans, and I think that we can afford enlarging uh, European Union by the Western Balkans. I can even answer to many questions that I'm getting from my colleagues who are saying, well, but do you realize that when the six countries are coming to the European Union, that uh, we have to change the institutional arrangement, that we have to think about the, about the budget, that Slovakia may become a net payer? And our answer is yes, we do, do realize that, because for us, the strategical, political, and security benefit of having the Western Balkans in the European Union is more than a short-term gain in, 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 in having still be privileged of getting the funds. It is not about this perspective, it is maybe about the perspective in seven years. The second, the trade. There are some good successes, I mean, the European Union had achieved in the last years, I mean, in concluding the trade agreements, but one thing I would like, uh, really, I mean, that has to be discussed more broadly is, is uh, Africa. I think that the Africa is the key partner for the European Union in many aspects, including the trade. And we, we should be much more brave. I don't know, it is very strange to hear it from the country in Central Slovakia, who has, uh, Central Europe, who has like five, uh, five missions in Africa. But the thing is that by addressing the trade and economic cooperation with Africa, we can address a lot of issues that are on our table today, including the security, peace issues, and migration as well. So because it's the transitory countries and the countries of origin. And the last one, the unity. Uh, I spent six years in New York, uh, and uh, you know what, the painful things which I was witnessing was that how weak we were in delivering the key messages in the General Assembly. That how we were not able to, to reach the consensus on that. And I'm not going to go very far, I just like to ask the two questions or put on the table two questions which are for, to me crucial for Europe to be more visible and stronger global partner and, the we, have, and we have to find out the answer. It's the first is the uh, common foreign and security policy, QMV decisions. I will be killed by the half of my ministry and part of the people are here also when I say that let's talk about it. Because if we set up the rules, rights and then conditions, etc., we can move a little bit. I know I'm not saying it will be tomorrow, but this is the first key issue. And the second key issue are the military capacities of the European Union and how to make it complementary on how to make it work with the NATO capacities. Because we have PESCO, we have EDF, etc., etc. But technologically, we are lacking behind, for example, the United States in the, in, the, in, the, in the military. So the thing is that if we find the answer to these two questions in the security and, uh, cooperation, then we can make a very huge step in the directions of becoming a more visible and stronger political leader and have more unity in the global, global issues. Yeah. 
And obviously, this is going to be one of the big priorities of the new commission with you know, the implementation of PESCO, the European Defense Fund, all the things that have been launched by the Juncker uh, Commission. Um, Pavakova. <coughs> I'll try to a little bit summarize uh, that part of the discussion. So we discuss about, global, uh, about the European Union as a global actor. The discussion is very easy because uh, trade, because values, uh, because credibility uh, based on the values, etc., etc. But the question of uh, global power is the question of our aspiration. It's much more difficult. And uh, I would like to return to that three, let's say, three plus one points. Uh, security, including military, military unity, European army, etc., etc. It was uh, the first postulate made by Churchill in a Zurich speech directly after uh, Second World War. We should be uh, ready also as uh, right wings parties to discuss about that question. Second one, common foreign policy. We have very good legal framework after Lisbon Treaty, but uh, we didn't use in the last few years that opportunities, in fact. Let's just say frankly, we didn't use that opportunities. And the third, po and the third point, it's uh, about innovation. It's very, uh, a very weak point uh, in, uh, uh, it's a very, very, very weak uh, element of the building of the, that aspirations to be a global power. And uh, Russian question. It's a good test. For us, as a Poles, it's good if uh, European Commission have uh, effective policy towards Russia. It should be. Because for us, it's a very difficult problem. But we, as a European Union, have maximum tactic towards Russia. After that, turning point after Crimea and Donbass, etc., etc. We have not strategy. This is the problem. This is the problem. I have no problem, I have no question uh, about the meetings, high level, middle level, etc., et low level, etc., etc. I have only one question to European leadership about strategy towards Russia. Today we have only tactic, and we have few national strategies. French strategy, German strategy, uh, Great Britain strategy, maybe. This is, co maybe, yeah. <laughs> this is, this is completely against uh, spirits and against uh, regulations, let's just say, in uh, Lisbon Treaty. This is a problem. Also, this is a problem for building a European Union as a global power. If we have a problem, with uh, uh, real politics towards our neighbor on the east. Well, and this goes back to Theresa Fallon's question on the divisions uh, in great power competition for the EU. Let's take a second round of question uh, and have the mics ready. There's a first question here on the first row and a question over there on the fourth row. Let's first take this one. Janusz Wondyszkiewicz, Euro-Atlantic Association of Warsaw. Uh, Frederick the Great allegedly said that diplomacy without military capacity is like music without instruments. So I would like to return to the, the problem of European security policy. And there are three questions. First question is what about European army? Shouldn't we clarify this concept somehow? The second, how to involve Great Britain after Brexit, you know, to create together some form of joint capacity to act. And the third question is, shouldn't we make some, create some greater clarity what we actually mean by the Article 42.7 of Lisbon Treaty, which gives us 
some kind of security guarantee, uh, but obviously it should not be considered as uh, creating the European Union as a military pact. So the question is, should we actually start the debate on, on the meaning of this article, or should we rather leave it as it is, sort of following the principle of constructive ambiguity? Thank you. Thank you. Let's take a question here. In the fourth row. Hi, Bart Shevchuk, European Political Strategy Center. I wanted to pick up on Jens Plotner's uh, remarks on approaches towards Russia and ask, uh, where do you see uh, EU's interests in common with Russia? Because you mentioned one relatively non-controversial topic of climate, uh, but do you see other issues of this type? Because I think we can easily see many conflicting interests with Russia, be it in Ukraine, Syria, on cybersecurity, democratic meddling, uh, even on trade, which is the primary tool of leverage against Russia for its misdeeds in all these other countries. So. I think that picture is relatively clear. Uh, where else do you see room, if any, uh, room for dialogue with Russia beyond climate? Uh, and would you see, uh, alongside you know, greater dialogue, additional pressure on these other conflicting interests, on this misdeeds in Syria, uh, Ukraine, and elsewhere? Thank you very much. Thank you. And we had uh, another question in the last row over there. Hello, my name is Gian Omikos. I'm the director of the Research Institute for European American Studies based in Athens, Greece. Uh, regarding the integration of the Western Balkan, realistically speaking, because I'm coming from the region, would be interesting, you know, for the Western Balkan before thinking to apply for the EU, three steps. Number one, fight organized crime who has penetrated, you know, the state authority. Number two, corruption is a priority there. And number three, you know, they have to follow the democratic principle. If we don't do that uh, realistically, this castle could be locked and locked. But this is something that we face every day. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and let's just take a last question here in the row of the middle. And then we'll go back to the speakers. Uh, thank you. I'm Colin, uh, Colin Alfred Kerch, director of NATO Energy Security Center of Excellence. And there was a name of pipe pipe in the, in the name and the question about Russia. I'm, I want to, to return to the uh, European Union energy policy and specifically Nord Stream 2. Do you think we are ready for, for Nord Stream 2 now, which is inevitably coming? Or, uh, or the national interests again will leave somebody behind, like maybe, maybe Ukraine, which is not uh, a European Union member, but uh, aspiring uh, country. So are we ready for Nord Stream 2 and the Russian gas again flowing big quantities to Europe? All right. Thank you very much. Uh, four other topics to address. The question of military policy uh, with, I think, the issue of Brexit that is so fundamental, capacities and the meaning of uh, the Lisbon Treaty, our common interest with Russia, the question of enlargement policy, and you mentioned the French proposals for reforms, so maybe we can go more in depth about this, and then the question of the energy union with a focus on Nord Stream 2. So let me turn again to our panel, uh, starting with you, Jens. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, on dialogue with Russia. Um, let me a little bit elaborate on that. Um, in the last commission, we agreed after the invasion of Crimea and the occupation of uh, Eastern Ukraine on the five Mogherini principles. Um, and, uh, and I think they are a good foundation. And, uh, and, and this is something which is important for EU consensus. What we have not done in the last years is to, based on these principles, develop a policy, develop an active foreign policy strategy. The principles have not been operationalized. A and I think this is a problem because this leads to a speechlessness uh, which is detrimental to our own interests. So that's my first point. We need to actually, uh, based on the principles we do not want to change, develop a, f a foreign policy strategy towards Russia. My second point is, the one I already mentioned, we shouldn't play the game of Moscow in bilateralizing our relationships. We should act as a bloc, 
and that especially for our smaller and more vulnerable um, partners and friends in the EU, I think is especially important. My third point is that um, if we have a common EU strategy and policy and an EU dialogue, this also, I think, gives also the bigger countries a direction um, in their Russia policy. And I, don't, I think if we don't have this dialogue between Brussels and Russia, a high-level dialogue, then you will see member states developing their own dialogue. Recently, there was a two plus two French-Russian dialogue, and I, I foresee that, that this will you know, not be the only example if we don't do it from Brussels. And my third point is that um, I think there are enough topics. So I mentioned environment, you asked for others. Um, I would say regulatory standards. It's in our interest that Russia adopts our regulatory standards and not the Chinese. So if that is our broad interest, then following that there are a number of policy fields we need to talk about with Russia and that brings us to trade. In trade I think it's our interest that if we modernize Russian uh, economy in order to be sustainable and environmentally friendly, who should do it? We or the Chinese? I think it's our interest that European companies from across the board uh, do this. And uh, my last argument is that um, it has always been our utmost concern in Berlin that we stay together on the essential questions of EU sanctions towards Russia. And all of us who have been sitting in the uh, Foreign Affairs Council know that with every semester expiring, it's getting more and more difficult to maintain our unity. And, and I think it is of utmost importance to keep this unity. So I think it will be easier to keep the unity if at the same time we can say, this is not preventing us from talking to Russia where it's our interest, Quite the contrary. It's the two sides of the, of the same coin I, I see. Very briefly, because I, I don't want to monopolize on Nord Stream 2, because some say that concerns Germany, I uh, hasten to add this is a misperception. I mean, there are half a dozen of companies across Europe uh, who are engaged in this, and the economic part of German companies is the smallest. But I don't want to dodge the question. Uh, I think Nord Stream 2 will come. Um, and I think we have obtained ample guarantees on which we will insist from the Russian government that this will not be detrimental to the transit through Ukraine. We will not let this happen. And um, the paradox is that if I look at the newest study of um, natural gas consumption in, U in Europe, at the end of the day, we will need both. We will need the transit through Ukraine, we will need Nord Stream 1 and 2, and Turk Stream anyway will mainly cater to Turkey and to the immediate vicinity there. So, so even from a purely economic point of view, there is necessity. The argument that Nord Stream 2 is politically bad because it's putting us in dependency from Russia, which we sometimes hear from our good friends in Washington, is not logical because at the same time they insist that the transit of Russian gas through Ukraine should continue. But if a Russian gas molecule is politically such a weapon, then whether it comes through Nord Stream 2 or through the transit in eastern Ukraine is really the same. So I think uh, we have to keep a uh, cold head and on this. Uh, Nord Stream 2 uh, will come and uh, it is of utmost importance to us that this uh, is not detrimental to the Ukraine and that it does not devise Europe. Thank you. So my country is not a military power, uh, that's for sure. Um, but I will say a couple of words on, on security because security is not only related to the military. And I think it's, uh, it's fair to say that there, is, that exi there in the EU exists a lot of cooperation when it comes to security, especially uh, sharing of information and intelligence, is it enough? I think in today's world it's not, it's never enough. 
and we need to enhance our cooperation when it comes to the sharing of information. The question that the gentleman on the front row made when it comes to the UK, when Brexit uh, happens, is very important, I think, and um, we should continue to work with the United Kingdom when it comes to security um, even more. Um, security concerns, terrorism, no, no borders, and I think likewise should be our action. So it's not a question of being in or out of the European Union or in Europe or elsewhere. I think in today's world, we need to work together irrespective whether we are in Europe, in the European Union or elsewhere. So I think, uh, yes, we need to work with the United Kingdom because the United Kingdom is leaving the European Union but is not leaving Europe. Um, then there is the NATO cooperation. Now, not all member states, including my country, we are not NATO members, but I, uh, I attend meetings where we also have the Secretary General of NATO present, and I can see that there is a lot of cooperation between NATO and European Union, and we have nothing against that, unless uh, there is respect for those member states that are members in the European Union, but not members in NATO. But we are all for uh, further cooperation uh, when it comes to EU and NATO. Um, there was a, a comment on the Western Balkans. I think um, we should also discuss maybe uh, the cost of not having the Western Balkans, who are part and parcel of Europe, geographically speaking, but not members of the European Union. I think the cost of not having these countries joining the European Union can be much bigger if we uh, do not accept that they, uh, their aspiration to join the European Union uh, will materialize. Um, two final things, one on energy security. Uh, for us, being an island state is very much important, and I think at times the European Union needs to be more, a bit more flexible to, um, to certain realities that we are facing. I mean, we are centrally located in the middle of the Mediterranean, um, so I think for us, energy security is of utmost importance. Projects that we are doing and that we did in, our, in my country uh, will guarantee this, but we need to do more, uh, including to have access to finance coming from the European Union, which hopefully uh, will, will come as well. And one final word on trade, and I definitely agree with what was said when it comes to Africa. I think the new narrative that we should have as Europeans towards Africa is that there are a lot of um, uh, possibilities for us and for our companies. Uh, if others are there, why we as Europeans are not there? Okay. Why are we are not there like, like the others? I think that we need to make uh, more efforts when it comes to our presence in Africa because there are a lot of opportunities for us as uh, I think we are connected to the space as well, not just uh, with Africa. No? You have a heavy metal concert okay. starting after, that's why. Was, was I saying something bad or no? no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But I will conclude here. I think it's better than... Uh, okay. <laughs> but I think we need to do, to do more with, with our African partners. Can you try to fix this? Just a valid scene. Does your mic work? Let's see how this works. Right. Yes. Um, I'll try to keep it very short. I think someone is trying to remind us that it's lunchtime. Um, <laughs> on dialogue with Russia, um, it's very easy to say we need dialogue with Russia where we have common interests. And one of those interests from my geogra geographical position is, of course, the environment of the Baltic Sea. Uh, so, um, but another. And However, we also need to have that dialogue uh, on areas where we don't have common interests or where, where we don't agree. So, uh, I would even argue even more important to have that dialogue uh, in terms of uh, political development or their um, breaches against international law, etc. cetera. Um, one area, again, from my geographical position is uh, where it's very important is ar the Arctic, uh, which has uh, increasingly receiving attention from, from many parts of the world. Uh, let's also say that we have uh, a lot of uh, good arenas to have or good, good for us to have those uh, discussions um, and that dialogue. There's the Council of the Baltic Sea States, there's the Barents uh, Euro-Arctic Council, and there's the Arctic Council, which are forums which w where we have concrete cooperation with Russia. Um, 
other than just dialogue with Moscow and the Russian government, we also need dialogue with the Russian civil society and people-to-people -people contacts. Uh, let me just finally say one word on, on the Nord Stream, um, because, and, uh, and again, this comes back to the Swedish and European very strong position on international law. If we argue that international law applies in other places, we have to argue that it also applies when it affects us. Um, we may have concerns about the Nord Stream, uh, but according to international law, we cannot, uh, we cannot legally stop it. Uh, and therefore, we say that international law is uh, sort of is the most, we have to keep the up, uphold that at all times. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, the energy policy and the Nord Stream, I mean, the pro well, there are not so many areas where we differ with our German friends. Here we do and we vote it out, and I think that we still have uh, some case, but we understand that it's going, and, and uh, that, may, uh, that may improve the situation, and of course it has the, the specifics that, that are reflecting and respecting the international and the trade law. But there is a big but with, with where we say that, well, this should not create the situation when we put Ukraine hostage to Russian supplies. And we know that, that it can be very easily done because like uh, now there is a promise that it will be still kept as a supply line. Sup but again, in two, three years, we may hear the argument, you know, it's obsolete, technologically not uh, able to transfer, etc. So here, I mean, as a price for, for having the Nord Stream 2, we have to create with Ukraine the well, joint venture, which will govern and maintain the quality of the pipelines going through the Ukraine. We have to work with, pro, uh, with President Zelensky about the decoupling of the structures, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But this is the only guarantee where we can balance, for example, the Russian narrative that may happen. That's the energy security. The second uh, uh, is the military capacities, etc. Of course, there are always questions about the constant con consistencies of the European Union, where we are weak. That sometimes, in some issues, we are not we are not consistent, and. Uh, when, uh, of course, when we look at the military capacity or the, or the army units or the, or the joint army of the European Union, we have to look at the picture that there are some countries who are not the NATO members, some countries would like to maintain the neutrality. Th these were the reasons why in the Lisbon Treaty there is no more stronger wording on the, on the military, military capacities. But again, having said that, we as the European Union have to improve our technological capacity and structures and the military capa capacity in some way we define in a, in a future. Now the Russia and the dialogue. The last thing, I don't want to go to the Western Balkans because I think that I made myself clear about what the position is. You know, let me use a small example, which is uh, of course like every, every example is not very correct and maybe not uh, very accurate, but I have a son. In certain age, he started to uh, annex more and more space from the virtual space. And of course, the, the first thing that came to my mind were sanctions. So I tra tried to limit his time, I tried to limit his access, etc., etc. And it brought some successes. My energy bill was lower, and of course, uh, there was lo lo less noise, etc. But it did not solve the problem. And if we would like to solve the problem, we have to balance the two things. The the punitive thing, but also the dialogue. Because otherwise, with, the, with only one side of the coin, we will not be able to get Russia on board on the issues that where we have to, have to be in dialo dialogue with them, and that which was climate and the others, which is not uh, tackled well these yeah, days. Thank you. I, yeah. All right. So I'm Pavel, ready to let resign. me give you a very yeah. quick last word to I, wrap I, up the I session. I understand your situation, <laughs> Chair, <laughs> and I understand the situation of organizers. Uh, only one sentence. We should reopen discussion. In, fu in future, we should reopen discussion about uh, common European security. Thank yeah. you very much. Join me in thanking our panelists today. <laughs> We're going to have a networking break, and a lot of the issues that we talked about are going to be uh, approached in the next uh, two days. Thank you.